Well, if you see the title, Marriage of a Submissive Husband, Matt Shedd pointed out to me that he wore his steel-toed boots today. So he came prepared to protect himself from whatever I might be talking about. And uh, if you're at home and your husband's in the other room, lady, go get him and get him in there quick. He might want to hear this, or he might ought to hear this. A few weeks ago, we began to look at the concept of mutual submission. And our verse was Matthew 5, 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. I'm going to review again for you a little bit. We looked at length at how mutual submission applied to the church. And the church is living in mutual submission is one of the evidences that we are living in a spirit-filled living. We define the word submit with two words in the Greek language that mean under and place. So submit is to place under. And we talked about two possible ways to view submission. One is to view submission in terms of ranking. The lieutenant is over the sergeant and the sergeant is over the poor little private and on the other line. So you're ranked. And in that way of submission, it means that one member of one group is over a member of another group and it's in a single direction. But we also have recognized that there's a place for that within society and a place for that within the church. And all that's in detail in, in, in sermons past, if you want to go online, southsidealive.com, and look at those messages that teach on mutual submission. The other interpretation is that submission applies to terms of interpersonal relationships among individuals, and each determining at, a, at the appropriate time who's over who, and that there's times that... Uh, for instance, that I would fall submissive to someone who's leading something within the church. Uh, so it's not just the pastor rankingly over, but sometimes mutually submitting to the guidance of someone else who has a particular role of the church. We looked at this one passage in Romans 12, 10. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love, honoring one another above yourselves. That's a mutual submission spirit that we should have. Now, I uh, pointed out that Paul uses this in a transitional way. He talks first about the spirit-filled church and what it looks like in mutual submission. And then he moves to family life and to wives and husbands and husbands to wives and children to parents and then moves into slaves and masters and masters to slaves, to which we applied that in the workforce. Now, we gave an overview of how both of these meanings of submission apply in family life. And through the marriage, we talked about how uh, the uh, husband has a ranking over the wife, or let me put it another way, the wife submits to the husband because of his rank. That is, he is the head of the home, and as the head of the home, she submits relationally to that, and to the rank of that, but also that the husband submits relationally to the wife. For if the husband is to love his wife, as this verse says, <clears throat> then that means that he submits to her needs. <clears throat> and uh, we're going to look at this in detail today. So last time we talked about the submissive wife, and this time, men, it's your turn as we talk about the marriage and the submissive husband. Our passage is a little lengthy today. I will be reading from Ephesians 5. 21 through 23. <clears throat> Submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. <clears throat> now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansing her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one 
ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I understand <clears throat> what it means for the husband to be head of the wife. Do you? To understand that, we concluded several things last week. <clears throat> What's it mean to be head? I concluded that out of Ephesians 5, where it says, For husbands is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, that there are several things it doesn't mean and it does mean. Let me remind you. It does not mean that as a head of the home, a head of the wife, it does not mean that you're the boss. It doesn't mean that you're a, to be a controlling person. It doesn't mean that you as head can have the right to express harshness. And it doesn't mean exclusion. That is, husbands making decisions without even including the wife in the decisions. There is a situation I know of some years ago where the husband, <clears throat> whose company was in more than one state, informed his wife he had already put in for the uh, opportunity to move to the other state, and it was already done, and they were moving within a week. And then she was told. How's that sound, ladies? Not good, does it? If the hand grabs hold of something hot, it would be wise if the head listened to the hand. And so I encourage men to always be listening to their wives. We're going to talk more in detail about that today. Now, it also does mean, as head, that connection comes from the head. The head connects to everything else in the family life. Vision comes from the head. Motivation comes. Actions come. Initiation comes. And this is where a lot of men really falter. They sit around and let the wife initiate everything. Not saying the wife should not have freedom to suggest things and encourage things. But if the wife says, why don't we go to Six Flags? The husband needs to get up and make plans to go to Six Flags if he's okay with it and thinks it's great. Now, he can still delegate. He can say, honey, would you mind getting on setting this up for us? But he needs to initiate. The evaluation comes from the head. And ultimately, the decision has to come from the head. And we, we discussed a lot of this in great detail last week as well. <clears throat> so headship has to do with the God-ordained role of the husband and the wife's ordained role to be submissive to the leadership of her husband. And as I said last week, if a husband is walking in the Lord, spirit-filled, loving Jesus and loving his family, I don't know hardly any Christian wife that would have a problem wanting to live in submission to that kind of a person. In describing the qualifications for the pastor, Paul said that he must be one, King James puts it this way in uh, 1 Timothy 3, one that ruleth well his own house having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man knows not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Now, I think it's unfortunate that King James uses the word ruleth, because it certainly gives the idea of the one who's ruling. Perhaps the ESV will help us see this a little better when it says, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, he will, how will he care for the church of God? This is a requirement of the pastor. Now, when I was in seminary, I recall being in preaching class, and all of us had to take this one passage in 1 Timothy and preach a message over it. And I began to study what that word ruleth meant. In the Greek language, it literally, it literally means stand before, to stand before. And I remember I made a comment that my preaching professor even ducked his head and went, oh, because it was so plainly clear of an application. Here's what I said. 
There are pastors all over our country who are standing before everybody's family but their own. And their families are going to waste because of it. And so a pastor must first of all stand as example before his own family. And then, by the way, this is the only verse I have for why I believe pastors need to be men and not women. is because as head of the home, which is a biblical perspective, he's saying here a pastor must be a head of a home leading heads of homes. So it's all connected in terms of headship and home and relationship. And so I want to point out to you, Primarily that this passage is dealing with the issue that in leadership, the picture is that you stand before your family by example. Men, this is your first ministry responsibility to be an exemplary leader to your own family. We also ask briefly the question, what type of head is the husband supposed to be? And the answer came quickly. The same type of head that Christ is over the church. The same type of head that Christ is over the church. Why do we say that? Because Ephesians 5.25 says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. So, here's the challenge today. Using Christ's love for the church as our example, how are we as husbands to love our wives? Remember, to love our wife means that we submit our life to meeting her needs. It is a relational submission. It's that relationship out of, it's that submission out of relationship. If Christ and the church provide a pattern for the ideal Christian marriage, what are the lessons for marriage that we learn from this? Well, first, our love for our wives must be a sacrificial love. He says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And then he says, and gave himself up for her. He's now described what that love is for the church. It must never be a selfish love. Christ loved the church. Not that the church might do things for him, but that he might do things for the church. The Greek has several words for love. The word here is the word agape. Uh, It's it's a word that describes a God kind of love. It's not built on emotion. It's built on a commitment. It's built on commitment to do actions of care toward another. Men, this is a command that we can only obey if we allow God's Spirit to empower us to be able to love. John Christensen was one of the early church fathers. He has a wonderful expansion of this passage. However, it is in the Elizabethan language because that's how he spoke in those days. Let me read it. Have care thyself for her husband as Christ for the church. And if it be needful that thou shouldest give thy life for her or be cut to pieces a thousand times or endure anything, whatever, refuse it not, do whatever it takes to death, to be cut to pieces. He brought the church to his feet by his great care, not by threats, nor fear, nor any such thing. So do thou conduct thyself toward thy wife, not with fear, but in such a way, not with threats. What a powerful imagery of complete sacrificial love that a husband should have for his wife. Husband, let me ask you something. Would you die for your wife? I believe most of us can say, yeah, I would place myself in front of someone else if a bullet was coming or whatever it takes for my wife. But that's not the real question today. The real question is, Will you live for your wife? Johnny Hunt said, Until you embrace something worth dying for, you haven't found anything worth living for. That's a great quote, by the way, Amanda. Until you find something worth dying for, you haven't found anything worth living for. Johnny Hunt. 
most likely you will never have to make the choice to die for your wife. But every day you must decide if you're going to live sacrificially for her, putting her needs above your own. Our love for our wives must be a sacrificial love. Secondly, our love for our wives must be a purifying love. Verse 26 in Ephesians 5 says, That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present to the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any other thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. <clears throat> The amazing imagery here is pretty hard for us to understand because we're not completely familiar with the meaning in Paul's day. But here's what we can understand. And that is, what is Christ's present ministry to the church? He is sanctifying and cleansing the church through the Word of God. And He does this by the work of His Spirit through His chosen servants. Earlier in Ephesians chapter 4, He talks about the gifts that God gave to the church, and He gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the very purpose of building up the church. So He, he, he literally gave this gift of gifting to grow and develop the church through the Word. The water in verse 26 is not referring to baptism. For one thing, Paul is speaking about a continuing process, and we don't continually get baptized. Water for the washing is a symbol of the Word of God. When Christ takes His church to glory, it will be then perfect and spotless and without blemish. The Word is not only water that cleanses the church, but in the next passage that we'll read in a moment, it is the food that nourishes the church. It's the spiritual food for the new nature of the believer. So how is this an example for husbands towards their wives? It should be the goal of every husband to bring nothing impure into the marriage. Everything he does for his wife is to bring her to holiness and cleansing before the Lord and before others. Any love that drags a person down is false love. Any love that is harsh instead of refining the character is a false love. Any love that weakens the moral fiber of the relationship is not love. Real love is the great purifier of life. Now, the third thing is that our love for our wives must be a caring love. He says in verse 28, in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of of his body. A man must love his wife as he loves his own body. Real love does not demand service. It does not require another to meet your own physical comfort. It cherishes the one it loves. There is something horribly wrong when a man regards his wife consciously or unconsciously, as simply the one who cooks his meals and washes his clothes and cleans the house and trains his children. FamilyLife.com has an article titled, Who Does the Housework? When both, in many of our case situations, when both spouses are working, many wives feel conflict and bitterness when their husbands don't help around the house. And here's a quote from this article. One wife, one wife expressed what many wives feel, and here's what she says. We have had a constant battle with housework. To this day, I feel like he doesn't uh, hear me or understand how much work I do. It has gotten to the point that either I divorce him for it or come to terms with the fact that he won't help out. I feel like I have lost the battle. The only thing he does is go to work. And don't get me wrong, I appreciate that, but I go to work too and do everything else, including all the finances, yard work, laundry, dishes, cleaning, kids' activities. I have kids and they do 
their share, but no help from my husband. And in caps, she writes, help. Men, if your wife feels like she's your slave, she will, you're going to have a hard time her responding to you when you want her to be your lover. Your wife will know you care for her when you take the time to find out what she needs. What are her needs? And then you set about to meet her needs. Don't assume that you know uh, what they are. Listen to her. Ask her what she would want you to do. Seek to know her needs. But really listen. Because sometimes you think you've heard, but you haven't really heard. A week before his wife turned 45, a husband asked her what she wanted for her birthday. She said, I'd like to be 10 again. So on her birthday, he got her up, fed her Pop-Tarts and Cocoa Puffs, and whisked her off to Six Flags, where they rode all the roller coasters and the screaming rides and gorged themselves on theme park food. Six hours later, she staggered out of the theme park with a splitting headache and an upturned stomach, only to head across the street to Wet n' Wild for four hours of water sliding in the sun. Next, he took her to see the movie The Frozen in a crowded theater, snacking on popcorn and candy and sodas. Then on the way home, he stopped by Chuck E. Cheese for a pizza, an animated concert, and a few video games. When the wife finally fell into the bed that night, he said to her, Do you feel like you're dead again? And she said, I was talking about my dress size. Now that's a good, you got to admit. If only you'd listen and maybe ask a few questions. Don't be like the friend of mine whose wife had told him, this was many years ago, but this really happened, told him and been telling him over and over again what she wanted for Christmas was a sofa and love seat. So on Christmas Day, he joyfully takes her out into the garage to show her matching motorcycles. Didn't work out too well. <laughs> Listen. Try to really know what she needs. Some of you all might recall I told you when I, my marriage was pretty much on the rocks and then I began to hear from God this very passage, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. I had no idea what that meant, but I was going to try to figure it out. And one of the things that I determined to do was to try to get into her world. I went down to the bank where she worked. We were in, in uh, Tahlequah at the time, going to college. Met everybody she worked with. Got their names, learned in my mind. So when she'd come home, and I asked her how things went, and she said, well, Bill did this, or Sue said that. I would know who she was talking about. Just little things that you try to do to get into her world are important. So then when you listen, you really are able to listen. Well, the fourth thing is our love for our wives must be an unbreakable love. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Now, I've preached messages on this section alone and can talk all day on it. But for the sake of this love of man, he leaves his father and mother and cleaves to his wife. And just real frankly, this is the strongest two words in the Hebrew language. The strongest word for leave or separation is this word here. And the strongest word for cleaving or being connected to, uniting in the Hebrew language. So the strength of it is you've got to get out from under mommy and daddy's coattails. And you've got to get into your own world with your wife. <clears throat> and it's crucial that you come to the point to where if there's a decision to be made between your family, your other family, or your wife, it's your wife. Period. And if you don't do that, 
I don't have a lot of confidence in your marriage. He's to be united to her as members of his own body is united to each other. And never think again of separating. It would be like choosing to rip my arm off if I chose to walk away from my wife. That's the attitude you need. That's the attitude that builds peace in the home. When your wife knows, no matter what happens, you're, you're hers, and you're there for her. I remind you that this amazing teaching of the ideal marriage was stated by the Apostle Paul, as I had shared with you before, in an age when men and women change partners with as little thought as they change clothes. So it was a profound teaching to men in that day to see their wives not as a possession, but as the prized jewel to put up on the mantle and love and care for and sacrifice for. The whole relationship is to be done in the Lord. In the Christian home, Jesus' presence is always to be acknowledged. Though he is an unseen guest in the Christian marriage, there are not two partners in your marriage, but three. And the third one is Christ. Why do you think many people want to be married in a church and have a pastor do it? They can go to the justice of the peace. They can do it in many different ways. Why? Because the pastor is a symbol, symbolism of you bringing God into your relationship of your marriage. One of the questions that I always ask a couple if I'm counseling them, is why do you want to get married? And if their stupid answer is because we're in love, I say to you, do you have a better reason than that? Because if you're in love today, guess what you can be out of tomorrow? You can be out of love. I don't love them anymore. Remember, the word like is a stronger word than love. By the way, this is free. The word like is a stronger word than love. Um, I've often said in my dating seminar to young girls, if a boy says, I love you, you say, hold it. You had not even told me you liked me yet. Don't be using that manipulation word love on me until I know you like me. Strong word. But when we move into the marriage and when we move into this picture and we bring Christ in the center of it, and I say, let me tell you, the only reason for you to get married, I'm talking about talking to two people who claim to be in Christ. The only reason for you to get married is you believe that God, in His unbelievable sovereignty, has brought you together. And that God has drawn you to this person for this purpose. Because let me tell you, if you tell me today that you believe God has drawn you into this marriage, then you will not be able to tell me tomorrow that God has told you to walk away from this marriage. I'm trying to build a sense of permanency that God wants people to have in their marriage. Now, in Paul's day, there were many times when the woman came to Christ and the man didn't have the Lord. And we looked at that a week or so back where it talks to the wife and says, wife, you know, hang in there, love him. You know, I remember when I first went to Cheyenne and I started teaching these principles and one girl, who's, one lady who, whose husband was just so lost, such a lost man, such a vile lost man, and she was such a godly person. And I've taught her all this stuff. And she came to me and said, where were you 20 years ago when I was a teenager and I needed to hear this? So I, I have no apologies for putting up the mantle of the greatest love. And I understand it. Things have happened, people are divorced and remarried and all that stuff. But let me just tell you, whatever you happened in the past is the past, but today you need to see marriage the way I'm talking to you about it. It is a commitment to stick with. And, and wives whose husbands are not believers, it is a commitment to pray for and to love and to still somehow honor them as headship. Remember, you only respect people who act respectable, but you can honor them in that relationship as you try to Pray for God to bring them to faith. So, uh, crucial. 
unbreakable love. Now let's sum this up. I want to sum it up by <clears throat> saying that the call of men I want to hear, read you an excerpt from a marriage ceremony to kind of sum this up. God has called the husband to present Jesus, to, to represent Jesus by loving his wife unconditionally and sacrificially. Now here's something that's in one of the wedding things that I do sometimes. I want to read it to you. To love means a husband must yield his desires and rights to his wife. He is to lay down his life that she might be found spotless, holy, and blameless. He is to be her salvation by surrendering his life that she might be highly esteemed and fulfilled. He serves not as her master, but as her Savior, treating her with respect and dignity and viewing her as his co-equal in life and ministry. The husband, like Jesus, has been called to lead his wife by serving her even unto death, to encourage her, lift up, and protect her. That's a summary of the passage we've been looking at. So let me conclude by sharing this thought. Nowhere in Scripture is the wife commanded to love her husband. Now there is a passage in Titus that tells wives that they need to learn to love their husbands. And here it is. Older women are to teach what is good and so train young women to love their husbands. Now, it's interesting that the word here for love is a different word. It's the word philandros in this one, but you've heard it phileo in other ways. It's the word that is a friendship love word. So this type of love is to be cultivated and developed. One can learn to develop friendship, and the wife is to learn how to be a friend to her husband. And, and frankly, that's a chore sometimes. <laughs> But you've got to learn how to be a friend to your husband. That's the challenge for the wife. Not commanded to do it, but to teach them to learn how. But the husband is commanded to love his wife. Again, the word here is the word agapio, which, which has to do, and it's a command. And it's the love that, that, that you can't learn this love. This love must flow through you out of Christ's love that's in you. This love must flow through you out of Christ's love that is in you. Final word. Men, you will never come close to being the kind of husband God wants you to be until you take seriously allowing Christ's Spirit to fill you with His power. Because, I'll tell you why. Us guys are all about us. I'm right, aren't I? Us guys are really all about us. It's the male ego, we call it. Give it any name you want. We're all about us. And you see, I know that when Carol had her stroke, my life turned upside down. And I had to learn that I was not, it was not all about me. I still had my fun times. I still did a lot of nice things. But I had to learn that it was about her. I don't want something drastic to happen to your wife for you to have to learn that. Learn it now. Because this is why it takes God's power in you to set yourself aside and to place her first and foremost. So, for a moment, let's ask the Lord to speak to us. And I simply remind you of these four aspects of love. And you let the Lord speak to you. And ladies, I know through this process God can talk to you about many aspects of your walk with your mate, or if you're not married even. Well, for future, you might want to just really reflect on this. Well, what does this mean in your future? What does it mean for how you even love the church and love other brothers and sisters in the church? It can be applied in so many ways, although we have zeroed it in on husband and wife. But there's plenty of opportunity here for you to let God speak to you this morning. Let's take a moment.
Father, thank you for the family of Southside. And Lord, I thank you that uh, uh, I never did it perfect, but you gave me a lot to understand how to love my wife. And I would be uh, untruthful if I didn't share honestly that I'm still in deep grief and miss her so much. And I need your strength every day. Lord, there are others out here today who their husbands have been gone for years. But thoughts like this draw it all back up. I just praise you, God, for the love you've given us to each other in our church and the family we have. May we honor you because, Lord, indeed, our church is no stronger than the sum total of the strength of its families. And may we grow even more stronger. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Praise team, come up.